Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on independent care review. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruption. I call it Nicola Sturgeon. First Minister, please. Uh, Presiding officer, the independent care review has this morning published one of the most significant reports we will consider in this term of Parliament. Indeed, I consider this to be one of the most important moments in my tenure as First Minister so far. I'm making this statement today to underline my political and my personal commitment to turning its vision of how we must care for our most vulnerable young people into reality as quickly as possible. I don't mind saying that I felt very emotional when I read the promise, the report's main volume. There is a really powerful simplicity to what it says we, and most importantly, the young people who experience it, should expect from a good care system. It should have love and nurture at its heart. Wherever possible, families must be supported to stay together. When that's not possible, the relationships that matter to young people, particularly with brothers and sisters, must be protected. And the priority when a child needs our care must be the provision not of a series of placements or arrangements driven by the needs of bureaucracy, but of stable, safe, secure, loving homes that allow them to experience the joys and the normal challenges of growing up and to fulfil their potential in life. None of that should be at all controversial, but it distresses me, as I am sure it does all of us, that this is not the experience for all young people who are in or who have passed through our care. To be blunt, we let too many of them down. They pay the price of that for the rest of their lives. And in too many instances, the price can be a life cut short. The statistics have always told us that, but in this report, we hear it directly from the young people we have a responsibility for. And that's not just true here in Scotland. There is possibly no country in the world where the care review's vision of care is yet a living reality. The opportunity for Scotland as a result of this report is to become the first country that makes it so. And I am determined that we do that. I want today to put on record my sincere thanks to Fiona Duncan and to all of the review group members for all the work they have put into this report. They have done, in my view, a truly outstanding job. I also want to pay tribute to Who Cares Scotland, a driving force behind the review's creation. Perhaps the most important achievement of the review the reason its conclusions are so powerful is that it has the voices of people in care at its heart. People with experience of care made up half the review's co-chairs and working group members. The review listened to more than five and a half thousand people. More than half of them were children, young people, adults and families with direct experience of care. The others were paid and unpaid carers and their stories have shaped everything in this report. I want to take the opportunity today to thank each and every one of those five and a half thousand. I know that sharing stories about painful and traumatic personal experiences is not easy. However, by doing so, you have all helped make things better for children and young people in the future. And I know that the care experience voice in this report is real. Since 2016, I have met personally with just over 1,000 young people who have experienced care. And I will carry these conversations in my heart for the rest of my life. Indeed, some of the early conversations led directly to the creation of the review. And as I read the report, I heard from every single page the voices and the stories of the kind of people I have met. And let me be very clear, I have met so many young people with good experience of care who are doing brilliantly. I've also met many young people who are doing brilliantly, even though their care experience was not good. That is down entirely to their talents and their resilience. I've also seen firsthand the dedication, commitment and passion of those who work in our care sector. And I want to thank them today for that. But I have also heard far too many heartbreaking stories. Because despite the best efforts and intentions of everyone involved, the actual experience of too many people in care is not what they have a right to expect. The world described in today's report of a care system that feels fractured, bureaucratic, unfeeling, stigmatizing, and mired in impersonal language like placements, contact, and respite 
To describe what should be loving relationships is one that I have had recounted to me many times. That must change. That is why the vision and blueprint for transformational change set out in the promise is so vitally important. At its heart are five foundations of care. Firstly, voice. Children must be heard and listened to in all of the decisions about their care. Second, family. Whenever possible, families should be supported to stay together with their children. Our first priority should be to do all we can to keep children out of care and with their own families. Third, care. Where living with their own family isn't possible, children must stay with their brothers and sisters where safe to do so, and they must belong to a stable, loving home. Fourth, people. Those in the workforce and wider community who look after children must be well supported so that they in turn can provide compassionate, loving care and decision making. And fifth, scaffolding. The system that surrounds all of this, the system of help, decision making, support and crucially accountability must be more supportive and responsive. The report also makes a really important but also very challenging point about risk. Of course, we must always consider the immediate risk of harm to a child when decisions are made about their care. But we must also consider the risk created when we remove a child from their family or overburden their childhoods with bureaucracy. The risk then is that we compound their trauma and make it harder for them to enjoy stable, loving, long-term relationships. Protecting family relationships and, above all, allowing children to enjoy the kind of childhood that others take for granted is often the best way of protecting children from harm. The report also sets out very clearly the direct costs of supporting children in care and also the hidden costs of the failures of care, the long-term human and financial costs that are borne not just by society but more importantly by the individuals whose experience of being let down by care impacts negatively on their life chances. Presiding officer, I hope all members will take the time to read this report in full. I've tried to summarise its principles and key conclusions as best I can, but in the short time I have available today, I cannot possibly do justice to the detail of the 80 specific changes that it recommends. What I can and will say unequivocally is that I am determined to get on at pace with implementing it. That will involve practical change at every level, but more fundamentally, it will require a transformation in the culture of care. As the review has been doing its work, the Scottish Government has already made some changes, for example, the introduction of the care experience bursary. But today's report leaves no room for doubt that we must do more, and we must do it more fundamentally, more systematically, and more quickly. A radical overhaul is what the review demands, and that is what we have a duty to deliver. I want to be clear, though, that we will continue to listen to care experience voices who have additional ideas and suggestions to make. There is not, and there never will be, or should be, a closed door. But we will act straight away to implement the plan section of the report. There are two key immediate elements to this. The first is the establishment of a team to take the report and turn it quickly into a detailed delivery plan. And although the report recognises that full implementation of its vision will take time, the process of change must and will start immediately. The second is the creation of an independent oversight body. I can confirm that both groups will include people with experience of care. In fact, half of the members of the oversight body, including the chair, who will be from outside the Scottish Government, will be people with experience of care. These groups will ensure we keep up the momentum that has been established by this review. Uh, the Government aims to make progress in a matter of weeks and we will update Parliament regularly thereafter. Presiding officer, throughout this care review process, and as I have been speaking to 1,000 voices, I have been uh, struck by the fact that for, I think, ministers in particular, but actually for all parliamentarians, the responsibility we owe to young people in care is a, a very special one. In fact, ensuring that they have an equal chance to succeed, that they benefit from the stable, loving relationships that so many of us took for granted when we were growing up, is one of the most important duties that any of us have in public life. It is a duty that I take very seriously and very personally. Today's report makes the need for action overwhelmingly clear. It sets out the extent of our obligations, 
However, it also gives us an opportunity, the opportunity to change thousands of young people's futures for the better. The Scottish Government is determined to take that opportunity. We will work with local authorities, care providers and all other relevant partners to make the necessary changes to care. We will deliver that change as quickly and as safely as possible and starting now. And we will ensure that people with care experience remain at the heart of the process. Presiding officer, that is the promise I make today to all those past, present and future who need our care. And in keeping that promise, as I am determined to do, I look forward to robust challenge, but also I hope to the cross-party support, interest and engagement of this parliament. I commend this statement. Well, thank you very much. So the First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised. I have around 20 minutes for questions. I'm talking through the applause so we don't waste time. Uh, can I ask Alison Harris, we're followed by Ian Glynn. Can I remind members who want to ask a question, it's helpful if you press your button to ask a question. Alison Harris, followed by Ian Glynn. Uh, oh, it's not Alison Harris. No. You've changed. Uh, <laughs> many have said this to me, presiding officer. Liam Kerr. Not for the better, indeed. Well, there's a first. Thank you, presiding Mr. officer. Um, I do thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. Uh, and of course, I do associate myself and the whole Scottish Conservative Party with the tenor of her remarks. I assure the First Minister that whilst we will always offer robust challenge, she can be assured of our support in delivering the recommendations of this ambitious and vital report. Above all, however, I too extend our thanks to the more than 5,500 people who contributed. It cannot have been easy. But it is clear that what has emerged can positively change things for children and young people. To do that, I agree with the words of Children First, who said, the report must not be welcomed and then put on a shelf. Young people in the care system need a great deal more than simply the best wishes of this chamber. They need concrete action to transform their lives for the better and to live up to the promise that I expect and hope every party here will rightly make today. So can I ask the First Minister, when does she expect the team taking the report and turning it into a detailed delivery plan to have completed that work? And how soon after they are finished will these much needed changes begin? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Liam Kerr for his uh, expression of support. It's uh, very much appreciated. Um, although, as I said in my statement, uh, part of the process of making sure we take uh, these recommendations forward will be the robust challenge that Parliament and people outside of Parliament bring uh, to this. Um, I also agree with Children First and with others who've said that we mustn't uh, put this report on the shelf. Believe me, uh, there is no shelf while I'm First Minister that this report will be going on. When we first uh, established the review, we were very clear that we didn't want to wait until it reported and uh, do nothing in the interim. So in the time this review has been doing its work, we have taken a number of steps. I mentioned the care experience bursary, but uh, the council tax exemption, creating the presumption for siblings to stay together and a range of other things. And I hope that is seen as a down payment on our intention to deliver what is in this report. Um, as I said in my statement, we intend uh, within weeks to make progress in getting the team that will then turn this into a delivery uh, plan uh, into place. Uh, my view is that they start work immediately. Uh, this will be a process in the plan section of this report. Uh, the review sets out a, a period of uh, a number of years where uh, this change will happen because remember it's not just a series of practical changes here those will be important but it is a transformation in the culture of change uh, but this is something that must now have start to happen now and continue and I think it is important when we get this team in place uh, and I undertake that we will do this is that parliament will be kept regularly updated so that that challenge um, and support can be provided and uh, one of the greatest privileges of my life has been meeting the thousand and, and more uh, care experienced young people over the last few years and I have no doubt in fact they've told me uh, directly including uh, some of them this morning uh, that they will hold us to account in this and I absolutely welcome and embrace that because this is uh, for them some of the, those who've told their stories as part of this uh, have made the point that it's too late to change the reality for them but they are motivated by the desire to change for others but one thing I'm clear about is that the time for young people to constantly over and over again have to tell their stories it is over. Uh, they've told us our stories. It's now for us to act and change the reality for children in the future. Ian Gray, followed by Rosa Mackay. 
Um, thank you, President Officer, and my thanks to you for early sight of the statement. The First Minister uh, is right that we have, over generations, let down far too many of the young people uh, in our care. And we can indeed hear that in this report, in the authentic voice of those care-experienced young Scots, and that is why I think it carries such power. So well done then to the review chair, Fiona Duncan, to all her co-chairs and to everyone involved. It is a remarkable effort. And well done too to the First Minister, whose personal investment in this issue is very clear and very much to her credit. Now, I welcome the creation of the delivery plan team uh, and the agreement to the creation of an independent oversight body. But I think it is simply to reflect the First Minister's uh, answer to Liam Kerr to say that it is not the process of change which must start immediately. It is change itself. Listen to Who Cares Scotland, who say today, the evidence shows that what the Scottish Government chooses to do next is literally a matter of life and death. We expect to see urgent action in the next few weeks that makes a tangible difference to young people's lives. Any further delay would be unacceptable. So what actions can we expect in the next few weeks making a tangible difference? And specifically, what can we expect to see tomorrow in the budget to ensure that we invest in keeping the promise? First Minister. Well, I, I agree very strongly that uh, it is not simply about the process of change, it is about the actual change. And, and that's, um, I've, I've said to many care experienced uh, young people that when I was asked uh, by Who Care Scotland and others to establish this review, I, I took uh, a little bit of convincing because I didn't want the review to be seen as kicking something into the long grass, that we couldn't simply set up a review and then do nothing. And we have, uh, I think, kept to that promise. We have taken a range of steps and we will continue to do that. I think though it is right and proper that acting on the recommendations of this report, we get the process right of not just those series of continuing changes, but bringing together a process that will facilitate and support uh, overall cultural change. When I read this report, I was struck by, and this is what we asked for, um, but I was struck by how different this is to the reports we usually consider as a parliament. This is not just a series of individual practical transactional changes, those will be important, but this is how we take the whole system and everyone who plays a part in that system and change how we approach uh, the care of young people uh, that are our responsibility. I don't underestimate the challenge of that, uh, but I am absolutely determined it's a challenge we will meet and all, each and every one of us have the responsibility to do that. So we will continue as we have done over the past few years to make the changes along the way as we go. Uh, on the point of the budget, I'm not going to preempt uh, the budget, but over a number of years, delivering this will undoubtedly have uh, financial uh, implications and will require investment. And the report is very clear about that. One of the things the report says very clearly uh, is the relationship between children going into care and poverty. One of the key things in our budget tomorrow, of course, will be uh, making progress with the new Scottish child payment, uh, part of what we are doing to help lift uh, families out of poverty. But one of the most powerful things in this report is the section on money and follow the money, where it tells us not just the uh, amount of money that we currently uh, invest to support young people in care, but the hidden costs, the costs of the failures of care. So this is, yes, about upfront investment, but it is also over time about making sure that the money we already spend, that is already in the system, is spent on keeping young people in their own families, preventing them going into care, but when that can't be avoided, making sure that they have the support that they need. Um, and that will not just be a, a feature in tomorrow's budget, uh, that will be a feature for budgets uh, for years to come, while we make sure that we're providing the care that young people deserve. Now, I have 13 members wanting to ask questions, and I've got 12 minutes. You can do the arithmetic, so I need succinct questions, please, and succinct answers. I appreciate it's a matter of huge concern, quite rightly, but please, let's try for it. Rona Mackay, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is an incredibly moving piece of work, and I'd like to join the First Minister in thanking all who took part. Does the First Minister agree that it's now critical that we see a pace of change, both systematically and culturally, so that we can all come together to support our most vulnerable children and give them the childhood they deserve? First Minister. Uh, yes, I think pace here is, is everything. Um, this report um, 
sets out a, a, a period of years, a period of 10 years for systematic cultural change. Um, and it does that based on a lot of evidence. As I've already said, that change has to happen on a continuous basis. But I think uh, one of the things I want to be able to do, um, and all of us have a role to play in this, is prove that we can do this on a quicker timescale than this report sets out. And that makes it all the more important that we get that early momentum behind it, which will partly be about getting the right process in place, but making sure we continue the practical changes that add up to the systematic change that this report is calling for. Liz Smith, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you. And I'm sure the First Minister will agree that the success of this will largely depend on the very strong collaboration between national government, between local authorities and the care providers. So could I ask the First Minister if she will ensure that the clarity of the roles that they each have will be set out when the independent review oversees this? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will give that assurance because I think it is uh, a very valid and important point. I've been heartened uh, just even today with the response to this report from uh, those in the system. Uh, the system is a word I have come to dislike using uh, when describing care, uh, but often it's what I slip into for shorthand. Um, but it is really important because uh, government has a leadership role to play here, but those who deliver care, most of whom that I've met do a, an absolutely fantastic job, but overall the system is failing too many people. So we need to understand those roles. We need to understand also how some of those roles will, will change. Uh, because if we are successful in trying to prevent more young people going into care in the first place, then the nature of the support that some are providing in the system right now uh, will be different in future. So it's really important that everybody understands their place in this and everybody pulls together in the same direction. Daniel Johnson followed by Alison Johnson. The statistics, as the First Minister acknowledged, are harrowing. Care experienced uh, people are six times more likely to be excluded from school, 15 times more likely to end up in prison. So what measures will the First Minister use to track progress and how will she report this back to Parliament? First Minister. Well, that's what we uh, will aim to come back to Parliament, as I said, within a matter of weeks to set out more detail on how we, uh, through the, the group that will be responsible for the delivery plan and the oversight group, will uh, set milestones measure uh, those milestones and how we will report to Parliament. And I think that is a, an important point that we have to get right at the outset. Um, the final point I would make in relation to this is, uh, as Daniel Johnson rightly says, and uh, as I refer to in my statement, the statistics have been telling us this for a long time. And it was statistics that drove me to set up this review. But I no longer think about this in terms of statistics, because I've met too many of these statistics. These are real uh, human beings. They are our children, our young people. Uh, they are human beings that deserve more from us. And I think uh, all of us uh, need to think of them in those terms uh, and not the statistics that rightly uh, we often point to as uh, providing the reason for change. Alison Johnson for Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, the First Minister's statement is notable for its humanity and compassion and its desire to put love and nurture at the heart of how we look after young people in care in Scotland and the Scottish Green Party welcome it and thank all involved. But what action will the First Minister urge to ensure that caring, caring relationships and important and essential bonds can be formed without fear of chastisement? Because the promise tells us that where caring and committed staff are afraid to cross professional boundaries, this can result in children growing up in an environment that can feel cold and comfortless. First Minister. Um, I think that is both one of the most important messages in this report and also to be frank and candid, it will be one, candid will be one of the most difficult challenges uh, to address and, and to meet. Uh, I have lost count of the number of young people who have told me about uh, the, the burden of bureaucracy in their lives and what that means to their ability to be normal children and young people. They need to have a risk assessment and get permission before you can spend time at a friend's house uh, at the weekend, for example. They need, uh, one young girl told me I've been at a, a party where she couldn't go on the trampoline in the garden because it hadn't been risk assessed. We must allow children to be children. Uh, but that also means having this uh, supportive environment for those that we trust to care for children so that they feel uh, able to provide that compassionate, loving care uh, within the, the boundaries that they understand and feel comfortable with. We need to change the balance of risk here. Of course, the instinct when a child is in a, a risky or potentially harmful situation is to get them out of that. Um, and, you know, we all understand that. But sometimes that may not be uh, the best solution. Putting the support in to keep a child there and to allow them to stay may be better. And that will have really, really challenging implications as we work our way through this, which is why, come back to the point that this is much more fundamental and cultural uh, than the, the normal kind of reports we have. But it's also what makes it mo more important and most important uh, that we get this right. 
Alec Goldhampton, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to Fiona Duncan for the inclusive way in which she's conducted this review. Right now in Scotland, when you leave care, a trapdoor shuts and you have no right to return. We all know that when you start out as a young adult, sometimes things fall apart and we have to sometimes move back in with mum and dad. This is not an option that is currently available to Scotland's tens of thousands of care leavers. Does the First Minister agree with the insistence made on page 92 of the report that young adults for whom Scotland has taken on a parenting responsibility must have a right to return to care. Uh, First Minister. Yes, one of the things I heard loudly and clearly um, as I have listened to young people is the arbitrary nature of some of the age limits that we apply in the system and how they, they have no meaning in the real life experiences of, of young people. And, you know, again, to demonstrate that as this work's been underway, we have listened. We've not only introduced the care experience bursary, but listening to what people said, we've raised and removed the age limit on that. And I you know, I, I don't think, and this will have different application in different aspects of what we're talking about here, but a young, <coughs> every one of us, you know, I'm not going to stand here and talk about my own age because it's too sensitive a subject this year in particular, uh, but every one of us knows that no matter how old we get, the ability to look to our parents and our families for support at difficult times in our life is really important. And care experience young people are no different. And as the, again, I come to dislike the term corporate parent, but as corporate parents, uh, that same lifelong responsibility must be there. And again, that's one of the key issues uh, that we have to grapple with as we create a system uh, that is right for people, whatever age or stage of their life they're at. Fulton McGregor, followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I too fully and wholeheartedly welcome this report. The review was clear that children must be enabled to build stable, lasting and loving relationships. So does the First Minister agree that it is crucial to ensure that in cases where staying with the family is not possible, children and young people are able to build those supporting, supportive and loving relationships that everyone needs to grow and thrive? First Minister. Um, yes, I do. I think that's what we, we need to stop thinking about placements um, for young people. What we need to create for young people who can't stay with their own families are stable and loving homes uh, where they are treated the same as, as other children. And I think if we start this whole uh, discussion from that premise, then uh, we are more likely to head in the right direction. And uh, that is so uh, crucially important. And it's one of the, the strongest messages that has come through uh, this whole exercise. And uh, it's all, I, I guess that's what we mean when we say put love into the system. Uh, but putting love into the system is important. Making sure we don't take it out uh, unnecessarily is an equally important part of that, which is why keeping families together where we can and crucially not allowing the bonds between brothers and sisters to be broken is such a, a vital thing that we must do much better than we have in the past. Alison Harris, what about Annabel Ewing? Thank you. The review's findings include that there is an overworked and stressed workforce. Clearly they do an exceptionally challenging and complex task and must be properly trained, supported and protected. What steps will the First Minister take now to support them? Well, firstly, I, I agree with that, and not just in theory. I've, I've seen this uh, firsthand uh, so many times, whether we're talking about social workers, foster carers, people working in our residential homes, uh, those who work more informally with, with children. Uh, they do a fantastic job. And the one thing I want to say here uh, to them very directly is that in talking about overhauling the system, it is not a reflection on their commitment and dedication. Um, and I think that's really important uh, to hear. We must support uh, those who work in uh, the care sector practically in terms of making sure that they are properly resourced and funded. That's why the, the budget tomorrow is important in terms of the approach it takes to public services. We must make sure that more of the resource we already spend, uh, spend is allowing them to support children in the right way. But actually, uh, going back uh, to an earlier question here, one of the most important things we must do is change the culture around uh, and in, within which they operate so that they can do what they desperately want to do is give young people the compassionate care uh, that they need. And that will be the harder part, but actually the most important part. Annabel Ewing, followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, as the First Minister has highlighted, the voices of care experienced young people have quite rightly been absolutely key in informing the care review. Does the First Minister share my view that the input of care experienced young people must remain at the heart of designing the next important steps? First Minister? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I don't think, uh, well, I, I think we would uh, 
fail in this if we didn't continue to have the voice of care experience young people at the heart of uh, where we go from here. Uh, there's no doubt this report wouldn't have ended up where it did without that. Uh, but I would go further, actually. I think uh, what we have demonstrated uh, the power of through the care experience voice in this review is actually how we should go about everything we do, making sure the lived experience voice is at the heart of it. And uh, that's certainly true here, but I'm sure it's got much wider application across uh, all areas of our responsibility. Jenny Mara, followed by Mark McDonald. Many Scots and children in Dundee find themselves in the care system due to a parent dying of drugs. Indeed, I heard of one just before Christmas. Is the National Drugs Task Force looking specifically at what can be done to prevent drugs deaths among parents? And what can be done to increase the number of supportive care places in areas with high drugs deaths? First Minister. Yes, I uh, absolutely think that should be a, a key focus of uh, the Drugs Task Force. Obviously, it, it has to uh, decide its areas of priority. But more importantly, we must make sure there is a proper uh, linkage between uh, the work we are doing here and other uh, areas of work, such as the work around uh, drugs deaths, because Jenny Mara is right to point out to uh, to point to the number of young people who will end up in care because a parent dies uh, from drugs. So the connections between these vitally important pieces of work is extremely uh, important. And one of the key uh, priorities of the work over the next few weeks in getting the process of this right is to make sure those connections are properly understood and happen as we want them to. Mark McDonald, followed by Jenny Gilruth. One of the most distressing stories I heard at the outset of the care review was of a public meeting where the members of the community were up in arms at the possibility of a residential children's home opening in their area. Does the First Minister agree that as well as the legislative changes that are coming forward, uh, politicians must lead attitudinal change across society to ensure that the stigma that still exists in too many quarters related to children in care is tackled and eradicated once and for all? First Minister. Uh, yes, and I'll be very direct here. I think all of us have a real leadership role to play here. We're all constituency uh, our regional representatives where we have a duty to represent uh, the views of our constituents but we also have a role to play in changing attitudes and combating stigma. I've had conversations in my own constituency with uh, constituents where um, I had to take a different view on uh, their understanding uh, of what a, a care home in a residential area actually meant and, and what the uh, the reasons why the children were, were in that care home and I think all of us have a real responsibility to do that actually having uh, the places where our most vulnerable uh, young uh, people are cared for in the heart of communities is not something we should be opposing it's something we should be welcoming because it's all about it's all part of making sure that our young people are part of that overall stable loving environment so I think all of us should think uh, very carefully I, I've been uh, forced to think a lot of things very differently as part of this process and I think all of us have to do that uh, in all respects as we move forward with this. And if Jenny Gilruth is uh, brief I can get in her colleague Stuart McMillan, no pressure. Thank you. Uh, the Care Review has highlighted the importance of schools in helping children to build relationships that will encourage them to learn and to thrive. Does the First Minister agree that this stability and support is vital to improving the educational outcomes of care experienced young people? First Minister. I agree 100% with that. I've spoken to many young people who say that the teacher in their class was uh, the only person that they felt they could turn to and talk to. Equally, I have to be frank, I've heard uh, stories where uh, young people have said they felt misunderstood at school and that people didn't have the knowledge uh, they needed and therefore they got treated differently because they were in care where their behaviour perhaps wasn't understood. So schools are, for any young person, a school is where uh, a young person spends a great deal of their time and will be a key part on in the stability that they have in their lives and that is even more uh, true for uh, young people in care so I think it is crucial I've heard in very recent weeks actually some great examples of schools doing really good work in this setting up uh, particular groups for care experienced young people uh, to help other uh, young people understand uh, what they experience and I think we should see schools as a key part of the solution here um, and uh, not uh, a part of the problem. Stuart McMillan, very briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, well, the First Minister joined me in welcoming the Care Review's findings that mental health support must be accessible for vulnerable children and young people and should be delivered within their communities. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I think, again, this report is very clear and explicit in terms of, of mental health. A lot of the general work we're doing around mental health for young people is important in this uh, regard, the new wellbeing service, for example, getting more counsellors into schools, all of that has general benefits, but I think uh, 
can bring particular benefits to care experienced uh, young people. And um, I think the way in which I, I, I mentioned uh, Fiona Duncan, Duncan in my opening statement, but I want to uh, just, uh, if we're reaching the end of these questions, just reiterate my thanks to her. I think she has absolutely uh, repaid the trust we've put in her as chair of this review in bringing all of these different voices and different issues uh, together. Uh, we've been given here a real platform for change and I think on mental health, on poverty, on all of the issues that are brought to bear here, we've got a, a really golden opportunity uh, to do something special here so that future generations can look back um, and not have to constantly talk about the failures of this system. Thank you. That concludes questions from the statement and I'm going to move on. There is very little pause. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, I do understand why you may wish to applaud, but it's not permitted. Um, can I then move on as quickly as possible with the next debate? Mr Fraser, get your skates on. There you go.